all the time. Uh, he's sold nearly a million do- uh, books. And uh, uh, what's the chances of him coming to Little Cross Point Church in Missoula, Montana? So I, I kind of shook the dice and said, okay, Lord, and uh, got a hold of him. And he said, I'd love to come. I said, you would? <laughs> and uh, so um, we made arrangements, and, uh, uh, and he's here. I've been looking forward to this for such a long time. He is such a wonderful gentleman and just a great guy, so humble and loves the Lord. And one of the smartest guys you will ever hear share the Word of God. He's one of the best Bible teachers you're ever going to hear. So it is a great honor. And, you know, I love you. And I I think you deserve the best. And that's why I want to try to do my best to bring people like him so uh, you can hear them personally. And so um, let's give him a great hand as he comes. Um, did I, yeah, all right. Well, uh, I, I, I love the praise and worship that you have here. It is so anointed. Thank you so much. And, uh, and I want you to know, Crosspoint family, how much I respect your pastor, Bruce Spear, and his wife, Jill. And you really do have the best right here in Missoula, Montana with Pastor Bruce. So... We were at dinner last night, and I was like listening to this. It says, he's got wisdom. He's got years. Of, I mean, there's lifetimes of wisdom inside. It's like, man, oh, man. And, and I'm really excited about the marriage series that you're going to be starting up in February. That is so very important. And, um, well, I spoke this morning on who is the king in America, uh, and I have a book and a DVD on it. It's one of those talks where I go through all the world's history, quickly, and I showed that the most common form of government is a king, Pharaoh, Caesar, Kaiser, Sultan, Tsar. And as the centuries go on, the kingdoms get bigger because with military advancements, the kings can kill more people. So instead of Cain killing anyone with a rock, they can kill with a bronze weapon, an iron weapon, a phalanx, spear, scimitar, sword, gunpowder. The weapon improves, but it's that same fallen nature of Cain kill and Abel. Uh, until the king of England had the biggest. The sun never set on the British Empire. He was a globalist. He was a one-world government guy with him at the top. And America's founders broke away and flipped it and made the people the king. And um, then uh, where did the pastors, where did they get the idea to, to do that from the New England pastors? Where did they get their idea of the Bible? What part of the Bible? That first 400 years out of Egypt before King Saul. So the book of Judges, a little confusing, I mean, but it's maximum individual liberty. Anybody could be raised up into leadership. Everybody owned their own land. Everybody was in the military with a sword upon their thigh. I mean, it was a citizen, individual-based, and, um, and it worked for 400 years until the priest stopped teaching the law, and every man did what was right in their own eyes. It turns into chaos. And all the people go to Samuel the prophet and they say, this self-government system's not working. We want to be like all the other countries. We want a king. Samuel cries and the Lord tells him, they didn't reject you. They rejected me that I should not reign over them. But anyway, America's founders look back to that period. Now, Israel's entire system works because of one key ingredient. There's a God who's watching everyone. He wants you to be fair and he's going to hold you accountable in the future. So you're about to steal. Nobody's around. You know you can get away with it. And then you think, uh, God's watching me. He wants me to be fair. Uh, he's going to hold me accountable in the future. Maybe I should hesitate stealing. And it creates something in your head called a conscience. If everybody in the country really truly believes this, you can maintain complete order with no police. Um, but if you get rid of this God, all you got is a bunch of rules that some old men made up. Why follow them? Well, some will, as long as it's socially acceptable. Others are going to say, forget this. They're going to yield to their selfish side. It's going to turn into robbing and stealing and smashing windows and random violence. And people are going to say, we want the government to come in and restore order. And the government's happy to come in and restore order and take away all your guns, take away all your freedoms, all all your liberties, and you'll be back to a dictatorship. And um, anyway, so when we broke away from the king of England, uh, it was really pretty miraculous that the king of England was the most powerful king on planet Earth. India, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, British Guyana, Canada, Barbados, Bermuda, Jamaica. He, was, he had this global army, and we were like a ragtag thrown together. 
thing. And so it was a miracle that we broke away. So we talk about that in a book called Miracles in American History. And it's um, stories from our country's past where there's a crisis, they pray and have courage and things turn around. And, um, and then another one is revivals in American history. Uh, first Great Awakening, Second Great Awakening, and we even have them all on little flash drives, all these presentations. So with uh, if, if I have my, my PowerPoint there, I'm going to go ahead and jump into it. Um, the, uh, do I do anything to turn it on? Uh, okay, there we go. So um, I'm going to tell you some stories out of history. Um, the Revolution, a lot of people know those stories, so I'm going to jump into um, the period in the late 1700s and early 1800s. And the first war after our revolution is the Barbary Pirate War. And I'll talk about this more Monday night. Uh, but every country in Europe was paying millions of dollars to the Muslim Barbary pirates so that they would leave their country's ships alone. And when America breaks from Britain, we're no longer covered under the British tribute. And so they go, oh, oh, America's a new country? That means you need to pay up. So the day after Jefferson's inauguration as the third president, he gets a demand from the Pasha of Tripoli for a quarter of a million dollars extortion tribute payment. Jefferson said, I did the only reasonable thing. I sent a squadron of our ships to the Mediterranean, and it's called the Barbary Pirate Wars. Um, so um, anyway, uh, and I tell the whole story in the book, and I'll talk about it on Monday night. But uh, this uh, when they win the Barbary Pirate Wars, there's a guy named Francis Scott Key, he's an attorney, and he writes a song. And he writes it in 1805 to the same tune that nine years later he writes the Star Spangled Banner to. And I thought it was pretty interesting because he uses some of the same phrases. So this is after they defeat the, the Muslim Barbary Pirates. He says, In conflict resistless, each toil they endured till their foes shrunk dismayed from the war's desolation and pale beamed the crescent its splendor obscured by the light of the star-spangled flag of our nation, where each flaming star gleamed a meteor war and the turbaned head bowed to the terrible glare. Then mixed with the olive, the laurel shall wave and form a bright wreath for the brow of the brave. You can see where he basically reworked this song nine years later to write the star-spangled banner. But, um, so during this time, I found in studying history that revivals usually happen at the heels of a crisis. It's in times of crises that people turn to Christ. How about you? Do you tend to pray more when things are going perfect or when things are not going perfect, right? And, um, and so what's a nation but a whole bunch of individuals? And so uh, I tell people God has plan A and plan B. Plan A is he blesses us so much we turn to him out of gratefulness. If that doesn't work, there is plan B. He withholds the blessings and we turn to him out of desperation, his goal is to have us turn to him so we won't spend eternity apart from him. He won't force us, um, but he does have plan A and plan B. Um, the second thing I noticed is it's always the preaching of the law before people see their need for the lamb. It's always the teachings that God is a just God and he cannot help it. He has to judge every sin. And if you're sinning, uh, he has to judge you. Otherwise, he's giving consent to your sin. And that's called the rule of tacit admission. And we know, see that in the old wedding ceremonies where the pastor says, anybody that's against this wedding, speak now or forever hold your peace. If you're sitting at the wedding silent, your silence is giving consent to the wedding. Silence equals consent. So if there are sins going on and God is silent and not judging them, he's effectively giving consent to them. And if he gives consent to sin, he's no longer a just God, which means that he, he, he's, he would deny himself. And guess what? He's not going to deny himself. Second Timothy says God cannot deny himself. So he has to judge every sin. The gospel is he provides the lamb to take the judgment. So that's why we approach this just God through the lamb that he provided. And, um, and so during the, prior to the Revolutionary War, you had the first Great Awakening revival. And you had preachers like Jonathan Edwards. And his sermon was what? Sinners in the hands of an angry God. And you read it, it's basically, we're sinners and God's going to judge us unless we repent. And it's like, you know, and people started repenting and whole entire towns would get saved and so forth. And this spread across the country. Um, well, then after the Revolutionary War, during the Barbary Pirate period of time, we have what's called the Second Great Awakening Revival. And so it starts off in the universities where you had French infidelity. So you had France... Yes, they helped us during the revolution, but then they had Voltaire, then they had the French Revolution, you had a bunch of secularism, and it began to infiltrate to the campuses. And you had all these kids giving up, becoming woke and be giving up their Christian faith. And so the president of Yale was Timothy Dwight, and he would go down at lunchtime and talk with the kids uh, and listen to them 
tell all their skeptical stuff. And after they were done, he would say, okay, I listened to you, now you listen to me. And one by one, he would refute all their skeptical stuff, and it started a revival. And Yale ended up sending all these missionaries around, and I'll tell you some more about it. But then the Second Great Awakening also took place on the frontiers out in the countries, in Kentucky, that area. And so there was a pastor, James McCready, little church and he sort of pastored like a half dozen of these little churches. And he had all the men of the church agree to fast and pray one Saturday a month for revival. And they have a meeting. 500 people show up. People start getting saved. They do another meeting, 1,500 people. Another meeting, uh, 8,000. The next year, 15,000. The next year, 25,000 people are meeting in the Kentucky woods. And there's, the nearest town is Lexington, Kentucky, and it only has 1,500 people, but you got 25,000 meeting in the woods. And so there was no hotel, so they would camp out, so they called them camp meetings. And, uh, and they didn't have microphones. And so they would build a platform, and every 50 yards, another platform, and every 50 yards, another platform. And some of them, they would be... Uh, People would be repenting on their face before the Lord. Other ones would be singing praise songs before the Lord. Others would be, I mean, it was all happening at the same time. Now, the stodgy religious people, they said, oh, that's just emotionalism. But then people that were there said, no, the people can give a reasonable account of their conversion, and they stayed converted after with that emotion, you know. And so God made us uh, beings with emotions, so there's nothing wrong with emotions, right? But um, anyway, and so this, uh, this spread, um, and you would have, I mean, Kentucky was pretty rough. I mean, they would talk about, um, you know, what was the one guy, Mike Fink, you know, a, a riverboat, keelboat man, you know, and they would like put little tin cups of whiskey on their friend's head, and they would be drunk, and they'd shoot it off the head, they were down there, they'd miss, and they'd kill the guy. And, and, you know, they'd fight and bite off each other's ears, and, you know, um, it's like one guy was like chopping wood, and a bear comes up, and he, like, jumps on the bear and bites the bear's nose. And the bear, like, shakes him off and runs away. I mean, these are, like, really tough, but, th- but they're, like... Not- and anyway, this revival sweeps through. And it's like they're all getting saved. It's like... A, uh, and so uh, out of this period of time, you have a missionary movement starts. Uh, and then we're sending missionaries to Caribbean, Hawaii, Burma. I'll tell you about that. Uh, they have the American Bible Society, American Tract Society, Society for Temperance, a bunch of dude in denomination to get started, prison reform, hospital care, and the abolitionist movement gets a shot of adrenaline. Uh, I'll talk about this probably mo- uh, Monday night. But uh, slavery, the first time you had a king on top, you had slaves on the bottom. And so slavery didn't start in 1619. It started with the first Hammurabi's Code, 1800 B.C., you got, uh, you know, the, the whole laws for slaves. And if a slave says that to his master, you are not my master, the slave gets his ear cut off. I mean, it's like, um, so there's always slavery. And it was Christians that started the anti-slavery movement, basically the Quakers. And they pushed and pushed. Um, but they were, you know, sort of doing quietly and, and promoting it. But then finally, the second great awakening revival is when the abolitionist movement gets a shot in the arm. And... Um, and so, now during this time, uh, Napoleon invades Spain. It turns into a longer war than he thought. He needs money, and he basically uh, swings a deal where he'll sell the Louisiana Territory, which includes the land we're on, um, sells it to America for $15 million. Um, the, the Americans go over to meet with Napoleon and say, we just want a little, you know, island in the Gulf of, you know, the Mississippi River down by New Orleans so we can, you know, anchor our ships that come down. And Napoleon's like, I need some money. Um, uh, I'll sell you the, the whole thing. <laughs> it's like, what? There was a slave rebellion on Haiti. The French spent, Haiti was the most prosperous island in like all the Western world, the sugar plantations. So the French Revolution freed the slaves in, in France, but it didn't free the slaves on Haiti. And so um, they had a 10-year slave rebellion in Haiti, and the French couldn't put it down, and Haiti gets independent, but then Napoleon's afraid this slave rebellion is going to spread to New Orleans, and and there's no way he could put it down, so he's like, let's just cut my losses and get rid of the whole thing. And so that's when he sold it. So Jefferson sends Lewis and Clark all the way up here and um, to to explore it. Well, uh, the next couple years, some Indians... Evidently, Lewis and Clark must have told them about the Bible because you have four Indian chiefs go all the way, um, Flathead Indians, Nez Perce Indians, go all the way to St. Louis, Missouri. And they're having a Methodist Bible conference. 
and the Methodist denomination was exploding in growth at that time, and they had the largest circulation newspaper. And these Indians came to St. Louis looking for the book to heaven. And they're wandering into churches, and they're trying to communicate, and, and uh, William Clark, Lewis and Clark, William Clark is the governor of the Louisiana Territory. He meets with them and everything. Anyway, uh, this story gets printed. And so a doctor in Massachusetts named Marcus Whitman, uh, he and his wife Narcissa go from Massachusetts to St. Louis and all the way out to Walla Walla, Washington. And they start a mission. And uh, then the politicians are going to give away Washington, Oregon, you know, parts of Montana. They're going to give it away to, to Canada to be under the British. And Marcus Whitman goes all the way in the wintertime from Walla Walla, Washington, down to Santa Fe, New Mexico, the Santa Fe Trail to St. Louis, and then goes to Washington, and he begs the politicians not to give away the Northwest Territory to the British, and he, take, he starts the first Oregon Trail. And it's the largest nonviolent mass migration of human beings in history. Right? It's not a war, not a family, you just have a voluntary mass migration, and um, anyway, populates the whole Northwest. Um, you have another missionary, Jason Lee, and he is basically uh, the founder of uh, Oregon. And then you have Mother Joseph, and, uh, and then you have Chief Washiki, and, and they're Christians. And their statues are in the U.S. Capitol Rotunda, right? So this is the, cat, this is the statue of Marcus Whitman. That's the statue that's in our U.S. Capitol Rotunda. And here's the statues of um, Chief Washiki and Mother Joseph and Jason Lee. They're in their U.S. Capitol. And there were Christians. And, um, but then in the early uh, 1806, you have the Haystack Prayer Meeting. And this is Massachusetts, Williams, by Williams College. And some students are walking back to class across a hayfield when it starts dumping rain. And so they dive under the haystack, and they're praying for world missions. And they decide to commit their lives to world missions. The rain stops. They go to class, they tell their other students, we just committed our lives to world missions. Their friends start committing their lives to world missions. And they start a missionary movement that in the next few years sends out 5,000 missionaries all around the world to Burma, to Caribbean, to Hawaii. I imagine all the woke energy, instead of tearing things down, being used to risk going around the world to different countries and other cultures and risking pirates and diseases and learning other languages and starting hospitals and schools and medical clinics. It changed the face of the world. Amen. They went into China. They went in. And so, um, uh, so you had Adoniram Judson. Uh, I tell the story in the book. Um, he was one of those kids when that French skeptical stuff went across campus. He had a friend named Jacob Eames that talked him into being an atheist. But Adam Judge was smart. He, va he gra graduated valedictorian of his class, and so he becomes a teacher in New York. He's an atheist, and he's traveling, and they didn't have hotels, and so he's staying at an inn, which is like a big house with lots of rooms, and he hears some groaning in the next room over. Keeps him up all night. It's like, man, it's so annoying. And I mean, he, it, the guy sounds like he's dying. Well, the next day, uh, Adoniram Judson's checking out of the inn. He goes, what, ha what was with that guy? He goes, oh, he died. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, what was his name? Jacob Eames. The very guy that talked Adoniram Judson into being an atheist. He listened to him groan and cry out and die all night while he was in there, but he didn't care because he was in there. But anyway, this was a rude awakening for Adam Judson. He ends up coming back to Christian faith, and he decides he's during this haystack prayer meeting revival. He decides he's going to be a missionary to Burma, actually to India. And so uh, his, uh, he's 23. He marries his wife, uh, uh, Nancy. She's 22. You read the letter to the, the father-in-law. And he goes, um, I'm asking you for your daughter's hand in marriage. You'll probably never see her again. And she's going to risk pirates and diseases in other countries. And she may die, but she'll have a glorious crown in heaven for leading people to our Lord Jesus Christ. And she'll have treasures before the Lord for eternity and everything. Anyway, the dad gives his permission and they go. Um, <laughs> they land, on the, he was a congregationalist, but on the way over there, he's reading the Bible. And this was sort of one of the doctrines that was discussed at the time was water baptism. And he was convinced that he had to be water baptized and the Congregationalists sort of believed in sprinkling. And so he decided that he was going to be a Baptist, which meant he was going to give up all of his financial support. But he does it anyway. They land in India and the, um, the British East India Company did not like missionaries. 
They were doing all kinds of business deals with the different uh, maharajas. And they didn't want to be perceived as stirring up little troubles for these pagan, you know, Indian kings. And so they, they basically told all missionaries, get out. There's two threads I trace through history, greed and the gospel. You always have people motivated uh, by greed, and they're the ones that take land from Indians, sell people into slavery, grow opium in India and ship it into China, which is what the British did. And they're the ones that vote for candidates that they think will help their pocketbook, even though they're standing for immorality. And there's other um, people that are motivated by the gospel. And they're the ones that will go to these countries and, and start orphanages and medical clinics and dig, dig wells and villages and risk all that to share the love of Jesus. And those two threads, greed and the gospel, cut through every one of the human hearts, cut through our heart every day. We have to make decisions. Are we going to be motivated by what's greedy or what's the gospel? Right? And um, so anyway, the British chased... Uh, added arm Judson, his wife Nancy, out, and they go to Burma. And now there was a friend that came over with him named Luther Rice, and he decided to go back to America and raise money. And he uh, ended up starting the, the Southern Baptist Convention, and he started dozens of universities. And there's a building at the... He started George Washington University in Washington, D.C., and you wouldn't know that uh, today that there was a Christian Baptist founding of that university. But they have a building there called the Luther Rice Building. And, um, but here he was raising money for the mission field. And so there's, there's a calling of God, uh, to one to go and the other to send. Um, a g- great story, Adoniram Judson, he's in Burma. He's working for a couple years, not getting any headway. And uh, there's this criminal, uh, this drunk guy that was like accused of murder and and, uh, somehow or another he starts working for him translating the bible into one of the burmese languages called karen k-a-r-a-n and unbeknownst to him there was an old karen these karen like violent tribe lived in and they were so violent that the buddhists were never able to convert them to buddhism so they just maintained their ancient pagan type of religion but they had some prophecy that said at some point in the future a white man would come with a white book and show them how to get to heaven and so this, this drunk criminal is like translating and all of a sudden he realizes uh, this is the book and this is the... He goes to the Karen tribe and tells them this is what was the prophesy. And 15,000 of them get saved. And of course, in America, they're reading the reports. 50, he must be a really good missionary. No, it was just God had a plan that was... And um, anyway, so, so that's Adoniram Judson. And um, anyway, I could tell his whole, his whole stories in the book. Uh, Captain Cook discovers the Sandwich Islands and called Hawaii and comes back, and now we have missionaries during this Haystack prayer meeting revival. Um, two Hawaiian boys, Henry Opokuaya and Thomas Hopu, uh, hop on a whaling ship in Hawaii and skip town and show up in Connecticut right where this missionary prayer revival is going on. And so uh, they get saved, and you have Hiram Bingham decides that he and his wife and a couple others are going to come all the way to Hawaii. And they start a revival movement there in Hawaii. The second boatload of missionaries to Hawaii is a black woman named Betsy Stockton. She was a servant in the house of the president uh, of uh, Princeton University. And he teaches her how to read, lets her read every book in his library. He lets her sit in on all the classes at Princeton. She feels led to be a missionary. He intercedes with this missionary board that was started after that Haystack prayer meeting revival. And they decide to fund her. And so she goes, it takes three months, goes around South America, makes it to Hawaii. And here she is on the beaches of Hawaii teaching the gospel to Hawaiian kids. Betsy Stockton, fascinating story. And then uh, Queen Kiopulani and uh, the... um, the high chiefess, she defies the, uh, the Pele volcano god and crawls out into the crater and comes out alive and eats some forbidden taboo berries that women aren't supposed to eat, and she survives. And so she helps start a Great Awakening revival sweeping Hawaii. And then the Hawaiians are sending missionaries to Polynesia and everything, and it's just spreading around the world. Um, now we have Napoleon conquering Europe at this time. And uh, he goes into Russia with a half million men in 1812, comes out six months later with 50,000. Like, whoa, what happened? Uh, you had the, the Russian blizzards hit, and then the Russians attacked in the blizzards, and I tell the whole story. But he's exiled to the island of Elba. He then gets away, and then he um, uh, gets all the forces together for the great battle of Waterloo. So France is the second biggest empire in the world, and uh, Britain is the biggest empire in the world. And... Um, once 
uh, Napoleon's fleet is destroyed and his army is destroyed, Britain is now freed up to look at America again. So now we have the War of 1812. And you have the British on Lake Erie, uh, which is where Detroit is. And they have long-range cannons. They just got done defeating Napoleon's navy at the Battle of Trafalgar, right? Uh, I mean, here we are in America. We really don't have a navy, so much to speak of. And certainly we don't have a navy at Lake Erie. We had to build the boats in the woods and then drag them across a sandbar to even get them into the lake. And the British have these cannons with the ships with long range cannons. And so uh, what happens is the president of America is James Madison, and he has a day of prayer. And he sets it in advance, but the date he picks is September 9th, 1813. Well, what happens September 10th, 1813? That's when 28 year old Captain Oliver Hazard Perry, most of his crew are free blacks from Ohio, and they confront this British squadron on Lake Erie. His flagship, the USS Lawrence, is splintered to pieces because of the long-range British cannons. The British expect him to surrender. Instead, he gets on a, um, uh, another little boat and goes over to the Niagara, which is his second uh, in-command boat. And he, by this time, the wind changes directions, and the British ships have to turn around. And while they're turning around, they get their sails entangled. <laughs> and they're, like, trying to untangle it. And he sails by and fires all of his cannons like a madman, and he disables the entire British squadron. <laughs> and uh, the, the cannon smoke clears, and these British ships are just sitting limp in the water. And so he captures them all. And he tells the men on deck, he says, the prayers of my wife are answered. <laughs> and then he writes to the Secretary of Navy, he says, it has pleased the Almighty to give the, uh, give the arms of the United States a signal victory over their enemies on this lake. The British squadron, consisting of two ships, two brigs, one schooner, one sloop, have this moment surrendered to the force of my command after a sharp conflict. And then James Madison writes, it, it has pleased the Almighty to bless our arms. On Lake Erie, the squadron under the command of Captain Perry, having met the British squadron of superior force, a sanguinary, you know what sanguinary means? Bloody. Uh, sanguinary conflict ended with the capture of the whole. And then, uh, now the British aren't done. So they march 4,500 troops into Washington, D.C. This time, the Americans just run away. So the British just flat out walk into our capital. And Dolly Madison is in the White House, and she sees everybody panicking. Her husband's out directing troops. She has them take down the, the only painting that was painted with George Washington standing there. She has them take it down. She rides out at Washington, D.C. on a carriage while the British ride into town. The British Admiral George Cockburn rides up to the White House, Gets off, walks into the White House, sees the table set because they're about to eat dinner. He sits down, eats dinner, and then torches the place and sets our capital on fire. And then he um, uh, goes to the U.S. Capitol building and he has his men sit in the chairs where our congressmen were. They all ran away. And he goes to the podium and he goes, who votes to burn the American Capitol? And they all say, I. And they set fire to our U.S. Capitol. And then they set fire to the Treasury and the Library of Congress, and they're attacking the Navy Yard. And our capital is going up in flames. And uh, the, uh, suddenly dark clouds roll in, and the wind and thunder grow to a frightening roar. Lightning begins striking at the British troops. A tornado comes along, and it's knocking off roofs and chimneys, blowing them on the British soldiers. And the winds are so bad that it picks up British cannons and drops them yards away. And even slaps horse and rider to the ground. The wind just knocks him down. And uh, the book Washington Weather recorded British Admiral George Cockburn exclaiming to a lady, Great God, Madame, is this the kind of storm to which you are accustomed to in this infernal country? To which the lady replied, No, sir, this is a special interposition of providence to drive our enemies from our city. <laughs> So the British are driven out, torrential rains come and extinguish the fires. The British are going back to their ships, only to find that, that their ships had their da riggings damaged, and two of their ships were actually blown ashore. And um, one historian writes, more British soldiers were killed by this stroke of nature than by all the firearms the Americans had mustered in the feeble defense of their city. All right, so this was a miracle that saved Washington, D.C., uh, James Madison, the president, the enemy, by a sudden incursion, has succeeded in invading the capital of the nation. During their possession, though for a single day only, they wantonly destroyed public edifices. 
Independence is now to be maintained with the strength and resources which heaven has blessed. And uh, Madison goes on, the two houses of the national legislature express that in the present time of public calamity and war, a day may be recommended to be observed by the people of the United States as a day of public humiliation and fasting and prayer to Almighty God. Could you imagine the president declaring a day of fasting? That his blessings on their arms a speedy restoration of peace, of confessing their sins and transgressions, and strengthening their vows of repentance. Now, in, in reading through lots of these presidential proclamations, I kept seeing this confessing their sins and transgressions. What's that? Our founders realized that before God can bless us, we have to repent. And again, going back to the fact that if he blesses us while we're in sin, he's effectively giving consent to the sin, saying that sin's no big deal. Just go ahead and keep sinning, and I'll bless you anyway. And well, if he's giving consent to sin, he's no longer a just God. He denies his just nature. He denies himself, and he's not going to deny himself. So you're putting him in a box when you're asking him to bless you while you're in sin. So the founders realized we have to confess our sins. We have to repent and strengthen their vows of repentance that he would be graciously pleased to pardon all their offenses. I've deemed it proper to recommend a day of humble adoration to the great sovereign of the universe. Now, a way of explaining this, uh, have you ever played with magnets and they stick together, but then if you turn one of them, they what? Repel. So let's say there's two magnets. One is God and the other is you. The God magnet has two sides to it. One side says, I want to bless you, and the other side says judgment, right? Deuteronomy, blessings and cursings, right? The you magnet has two sides. One side says, repent and believe, and the other side says, doubt and sin. If you have your repent and believe side facing God's I want to bless you side, the magnets stick together. If you flip and have doubt and sin, God cannot bless doubt. Remember the Bible? Jesus went to his hometown in Nazareth, and it says he could do very few miracles there because of their unbelief. In other words, he wanted to do them, but the, he couldn't get, it's like, you know, it's like you're trying to, to plug it in the outlet, but, uh, but the, the prongs are broken, you know? It's like he couldn't get the connection. So God cannot bless doubt, but God cannot bless sin. Remember the children of Israel coming into the promised land? I mean, they're unbeatable. And there's a king, Balak, who gets a prophet, Balaam, to stand on a hill and curse Israel. But it comes out a blessing does it three times. And this King Balak is like pulling his hair out. I said, I told you to curse him. You're blessing him. And he says, you cannot curse what God has blessed. But you read a couple chapters later, Balaam told Balak, if you send the young Moabite girls into the Israeli camp and lure them into sin, if they sin against their God, you can defeat him in battle. And God was so upset at Balaam for letting him in on this secret that Balaam gets killed later, but then in the book of Revelation, it talks about Balaam, and it says this one church is telling them that it's okay to do sexual immorality, and it's okay to have sexual sin, and they're doing the sin of Balaam. And um, anyway, so if we insist on having our doubt and sin side facing God, his magnet flips around to judgment. He's a just God after all. And so sort of like a, a homing signal for a missile. Right? When you're insisting stubbornly on your sin, that judgment is coming. Now, the moment you repent, it's like the, it repels and the <laughs> missile goes off somewhere else. Right? And um, so the founders realized this. Uh, and um, so what happened in New England? After the British were driven out of Washington, D.C., they go to Baltimore. It was the third biggest city in America. And the British fire... 1,800 cannonballs nonstop for 25 hours. And the storm system that was over Washington, D.C., moves over Baltimore, and it dumps rain. Now, if you've ever been to Fort McHenry, it's an earthen fort. It means they pile up all this dirt, you know, in the walls. And, and so a whole lot of those cannonballs were just sinking in the mud. And, um, but finally, Francis Scott Key is an attorney, and he rows out to a, a British boat and says, hey, I want to do a prisoner exchange. You got our beloved Dr. William Beans, and we got some of your British guys. Let's, let's do a swap. And Admiral George Cockburn says, later, we're not going to talk about that. And I'm not going to let you go because you're in on us about to attack Fort Baltimore. And so Francis got keys on this boat while these 1,800 cannonballs are being, and he's like, oh, no. And the next morning he sees the flag still waving. Now, we're all familiar with the first stanza of the Star-Spangled Banner. 
But the fourth stanza had a lasting effect. And it says, so basically he reworked that song that he wrote after the Barbary Pirate War. Uh, and so this is the reworked stanza four. It says, Oh, thus be it ever when free men shall stand between their love at home and the war's desolation. Blessed with victory and peace, may the heaven rescued land. Praise the power that has made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause it is just, and this be our motto, in God is our trust. And the star-spangled banner and triumph shall wave over the land of the free and the home of the brave. And that phrase, in God we trust, became our national motto, and Lincoln put it on our coins. And then Eisenhower put it on our paper currency. And um, so these stories are in this book. Now, the, the war ended. The War of 1812 is over. But nobody has a phone to call New Orleans. <laughs> and so the British have 10,000 troops, and they're attacking New Orleans. So what were the British doing? They control Pensacola, Florida, and they go to the Red Stick Creek Indians. You know the French pronunciation of Red Stick? Baton Rouge. Like Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And so the British go uh, control Pensacola, and north of that is the Red Stick Creek Indians in Fort Mims, Alabama. And the British promise the Indians money for scalps. And so they stir up. And so um, now these Red Sticks, uh, they attack the fort, and the fort surrenders, and they have 500 that they captured. Well, they proceeded to scalp all 500 of them. And uh, so this terrible, here's the historical marker. It says, Fort Mims, here in Creek Indian War, 1813-14, took place the most brutal massacre in American history. Indians took the fort with heavy loss, then killed all but about 36 of the some 550 in the fort. Creeks had been armed by British at Pensacola in this phase of the War of 1812. So, uh, Andrew Jackson defeats the, the Red Stick Creek Indians, um, and then after that, he's got the Battle of New Orleans. And so uh, the British have 10,000 troops, and they're marching toward uh, Andrew Jackson's men. They take an abandoned canal where they're taking a stand. The British are covered by fog. New Orleans, below sea level, you know, there's a lot of moisture and fog. And so they're coming up, and uh, right when they get where Andrew Jackson's men are, the fog lifts. And the Americans see the British about this far away, and they, they kill 2,000 British and uh, they killed the commander. Only eight Americans die. I mean, the British are the most powerful military in the world. And 2,000, that would be a big deal today if 2,000 guys get killed. Only eight Americans. And so um, the, uh, they killed the British commander. And the British soldiers uh, would do what their commanders would tell them, and they didn't have a commander. And so for like 30 minutes, the British are like, what do we do? Do we, go, do we, do we continue attacking? Do we, and they're just being shot to pieces. And, uh, and so that saves New Orleans and all that area. And Andrew Jackson writes, it appears the unerring hand of providence shielded my men from the shower of balls, bombs, and rockets when every ball bomb from our gun carried with them a mission of death. And uh, he, th this battle allowed us to take all of Florida. And so that's why Jacksonville, Florida is named after Andrew Jackson. And um, he writes uh, to Major Dravizek, I was sure of success for I knew God would not give me previsions of disaster, but signs of victory. He said, this ditch can never be passed. It cannot be done. And like, when did God tell Andrew Jackson that? Well, there's a big church in New Orleans uh, called you know, St. Louis Church. And he had gone in there before the battle to pray. And he told the pastor on his way out that, that he felt like the Lord had given him this, this word. And um, anyway, Jackson writes to the Secretary of War, James Monroe, Heaven, to be sure, has interposed most wonderfully on our behalf. I'm filled with gratitude when I look back at what we have escaped. And uh, so again, these are stories that are in this book, Miracles in American History. Now, during this time, you have William Wilberforce, a Christian. Uh, he uh, works to get rid of slavery in Britain. He is influenced by John Newton. Um, John Newton was, his dad was in the British Navy. His dad arranged for him to be a young cabin, you know, a young boy in the British Navy. And then one time he uh, is visiting his girlfriend and he misses when his boat departs. And then he is um, uh, impressed onto another British ship. Impressed means that they would send these basically a gang of guys to the port and if they found some young guy all by himself they would just simply grab you and drag you onto the ship and put you below deck 
And then once you're 100 miles out to sea, they would take you out and say, if you want to get fed, you've got to start working on this. And, you gotta, and they would impress them to become a British sailor. And so um, this uh, John Newton was such an honorary guy, and that they would like whip him and beat him, that finally the captain of the ship traded him to a slave ship. And he was such an honorary guy that when the slave ship went to Africa to purchase more slaves from the Africans, you had like the Ashanti tribe was capturing other tribes and selling them. And uh, talk about Monday night, but Islam enslaved over 180 million Africans. And, you know, anyway. So, um, so now John Newton is traded to the tribe that is selling. So now he's a slave to the slave traders in Africa. And uh, finally, he, he gets back on a ship, and then he, but he's still a rotten guy. And then um, somebody gives him Thomas Kempis book, uh, Imitation of Christ. He's reading it, and there's a storm. And this storm was so bad, he, he's convinced he's going to sink, and he prays for the first time in his life and survives. And then he ends up studying, and he decides he wants to get out of the slave business, and then he decides he wants to be a minister. But to be an Anglican minister, it's like really involved. And so he has to like teach himself, you know, Latin and everything. And, and they finally put, give him some little rinky-dink church out in nowhere. And, um, but that's when he starts writing hymns. And that's when he wrote Amazing Grace. John Newton wrote Amazing Grace. I once was lost, but now I'm found as blind, but now I can see. And um, so he disciples William Wilberforce, who's a parliamentarian, and he gets saved, and he wants to give up government and wants to be a preacher. And John Newton says, no, 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 you can serve God in government. And so John Newton uh, does this little thing where everybody's out for some race and uh, horse racing. And he um, is able to keep just enough people for a quorum. It means you have to have a certain amount of people in Parliament to do business. But it was all of his friends. And that's when they pass a law outlawing the slave trade in the British Empire which was a big deal, but it didn't free the slaves that were already slaves. So he spends another 30 years fighting, and he finally ends up where the British Empire votes to end the slave trade. And, um, and this is during the time of the Second Great Awakening revival in America. And so, um, uh, how am I doing time-wise? I forgot what time you told me to... Uh, uh, ten minutes. Okay, um, so let me tell you the story of John Stewart. So this is during the early 1800s, uh, he is a free black, and he's um, in Virginia, headed to Ohio, and he is a dyer of clothes, like blue jeans, you know, you dye in blue, and he has his life savings, and he's robbed, and he is so upset that he was robbed that he goes to the nearest town, like Marion, Ohio, and he decides to drink himself to death. His hands are shaking, I mean, he's like real, and um, so then he uh, tries to clean up his life, and um, he, he doesn't get anywhere. And so, uh, so this is his story. Um, Power Hot in Virginia is where he's from and uh, robbed along the way, uh, decides to drink himself to death. It's all written in a book called The Missionary Pioneer, John Stewart, Man of Color. And he uh, says, the loss of property, distance from his friends, the idea of poverty, disgrace, together with the wretched situation of his mind on account of his soul's affairs, brought him to the shocking determination that he would immediately take measures to hasten his dissolution. And for this purpose, he forthwith commenced a course of excessive drinking in a public house. This was continued until his nerves became much affected, his hands trembled, so much difficult for him to feed himself. Stewart tried to straighten out his life, work in a country to make sugar. It's written about another book, Thelma Marsh, Moccasin Trails, United Methodist Church History. Stewart returned to town where, contrary to the most solemn vows and promises which he had previously made to forsake sin and seek the Lord, uh, an occurrence here took place which much alarmed Stewart. An intimate companion of his was suddenly called from death from time to eternity. With this individual, he had made an appointment to spend one more night in sin, but death interfered and disappointed them both. So here he's trying to clean up his life, and his old drinking buddy says, hey, come on, one more night of party, and then his friend dies that day. And so Stewart began to despair of ever obtaining mercy. Uh, the book John Stewart, Missionary Pioneer, says that one day while wandering along the banks of the Ohio River, bewailing his wretched and undone condition, the archenemy of souls suggested to him a remedy, which was to terminate the miseries he endured by leaping into the deep and thereby putting an end to his existence to the suggestion he at first felt a disposition to yield. His attention was arrested by a voice which he thought called him by name. John, 
when on looking around, he could see no person. Whereupon he, he desisted from the further prosecution of the desperate project. And he comes back to town. He's walking in here singing. It's a camp meeting revival. Remember those camp meeting revivals? And he is drawn by the singing and the music to it. And um, he heard the sound of singing, praying. It proved to be a Methodist prayer meeting. Uh, first, his prejudices for bad is going in, but curiosity prompted him to venture a little nearer. And at length, he resolved to enter and make his case known. And then it was the Lord was pleased to reveal his mercy and pardoning love to his fainting soul, causing him to burst forth in unspeakable joy, declaring what the Lord had done for his poor soul. And um, then soon after this, he attended the camp meeting, remained there for some time with a heavy heart. At length, he resolved by taking place among the mourners of the assembly, where he lay deploring his case all night, even until the break of day, at which time the sun of righteousness broke into his dark, bewildered soul. And he heard a sound which much alarmed him, and a voice, as he thought, said to him, Thou shalt declare my counsel faithfully. At the same time, a view seemed to open to him in a northwest direction. And a strong impression was made on his mind that he must go out that course into the world to declare the counsel of God. So here he is praying all night, and the next day he just feels led. He's supposed to walk northwest. And so he set out without credentials, direction, money, bread, crossed the Muscogum River for the first time, traveled northwest course, not knowing whither he went. And he was frequently informed that it would lead him into Indian country on the Sandusky River. Sometimes with, sometimes without a road, sometimes wading waters, swimming the rivers. Uh, another book, Abraham Bauman, Past and Present Wyandotte County, Ohio says that at Pipe Town, there was a considerable body of Delaware Indians. At this place, Stewart stopped, but as the Indians were preparing for a great dance, they paid but little attention to him. Stewart took out his hymn book and began to sing. He, as is usual with many of his race, had a most melodious voice, and as a result of his efforts, the Indians present were charmed and awed into perfect silence. When he ceased, Johnny Cake said in broken English, Sing more! <laughs> He then asked if there was any person who could interpret. Old lions who called themselves 160 years old, for he counted the summer a year and the winter a year, came forward. <laughs> Stuart talked to them. Stuart made it to the tribe of Wyandots, who were called by the French Huron. They previously had treaties with the French during the French and Indian War, but when the French lost, the Indians lost, and the land was taken. And then they uh, were fought with the British against America during the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812. And when the British lost, they had more land taken away. And uh, Stuart convinced th him that he had come to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the children of the forest. John Stuart reached the home of the Indian William Walker Sr., who was first believed Stuart to be a runaway slave. Realizing Stuart could not speak wine, that William Walker sent him to Jonathan Pointer, a black man who in his youth had been kidnapped by the Wyandotte, adopted into the tribe and spoke Wyandotte. Pointer interpreted for Stuart, but not wanting his friends to think he believed, he ended each talk with these words, uh, these are his words and not mine, or that's what the preacher says, but I don't believe it. <laughs> Wouldn't it be terrible to have an interpreter? And you're like preaching, it's like, yeah, I don't believe any of that. <laughs> and um, anyway, so... Uh, Pointer, the interpreter, eventually converted. One of John Stewart's first converts was chief between the logs, who years before, in a drunken fit, killed his wife, only to wake up in horror the next day when he realized what he had done. And so uh, the chief between the logs says, Then there was war between our fathers and the president, King George, but the time of war was over. We had many scattered, many killed and died. Our chiefs thought to get our nation together again. Then the black man, Stewart, our brother, Pointer to Stewart, came to us and told us he was sent by the great spirit to tell us the true and good way. But we thought he was like all the rest, that he too wanted to cheat us and get our money and land from us. We treated him ill and gave him little to eat and trampled on him and were jealous of him for a whole year. Then we attended his meeting in the council house. We could find no fault with him. He told us of our sins, that the drinking was ruining us and that the great spirit was angry with us. He says, we must leave these things. The great spirit came upon us so that we all cried aloud. Some clapped their hands, some ran away, and some were angry. We held our meeting all night, sometimes singing, sometimes praying. But now we are convinced that God had sent him to us. Stuart is a good man. Eventually, the entire Wyandotte tribe converted to Christianity. 
And then you, his last words were, be faithful. And then you had the Indian Removal Act, right? So Andrew Jackson, uh, the first Democrat president, uh, yeah, he did good, right, defeating the British, but he didn't think the Indians and the Americans would get along. And so um, Georgia had discovered gold, and the Cherokee owned the land, and people were taking the land from the Indians, starting fights. And so uh, the, uh, the uh, Christians, missionaries to the Cherokee, said they should not be chased out. And the Christians brought a lawsuit that went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court decided in favor of the Cherokee. John Marshall was the justice. And Andrew Jackson supposedly said, um, Marshall made his decision, let him enforce it. In other words, Supreme Court justices do not control an army. They can't enforce anything. It's the president that has to take the decision and decide to enforce it. And um, anyway, so, uh, but it was Christian missionaries that were arguing to let them keep their land. And um, anyway, so some of the tribes decided to leave early. The Cherokee decided that, no, they're, they're not going to chase us out. And they waited late, and that's when you had the Trail of Tears. But uh, the ones that led er left early were the, were the Wyandots. They decided, okay, let's just bite the bullet. We've already been chased out a bunch of times. And so they send uh, people to go forward and acquire land along the Missouri River. And the whole tribe moves along the Missouri River, and they called it Wyandot City in Wyandot County. And a few years later, they changed the name of the city to Kansas City. But Kansas City is still in Wyandotte County, which was a Christian Indian tribe that was brought to faith by a black man, John Stewart, who had a tragedy of being robbed and all of his stuff taken away, but then going to a camp meeting and getting saved and turning to the Lord. And, um, well, this is just part of our American history. And... Um, you know, we see salvation from our point of view, but let's look at it from God's point of view just for a moment. Think of God. Here's God. He exists for eternity. Eternity upon eternity upon eternity. There's never been a time when God has not existed. And he makes everything. And he makes everything with rules. Laws of planetary motion, laws of gravity, laws of science. Everything's laws. And um, just to give you an idea how big God is, in 2003, they had the Hubble Telescope focus on a little spot in the sky where there was nothing. The spot was so small, it was the size of a grain of sand held out between your fingers against the night sky. Teeny spot, nothing there. They focused the Hubble telescope on it for 11 days. When they developed the images, in that little spot was 10,000 galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars in each galaxy. And because light travels in waves, with blue being the shortest and fastest and red being the longest and slowest, they had a red shift, which means they were moving away from us. And they were able to, to figure out that the universe is 93 billion light years across. And get this, still expanding at the speed of light. The largest star they found is Stevenson 2-18. It's a super gas giant. It is so big, if you were to place Stevenson 2-18 in our solar system, it would engulf the orbit of Saturn, the sixth planet from the sun. We're the third planet from the sun. Could you imagine one star that big? And God made it all. But what's a galaxy anyway? It's a bunch of rocks. Hot rocks, cold rocks, vaporized rocks. A rock cannot love you. So it's almost like at some time in eternity past, God said, been there, done that, I can make galaxies. I can make everything, and everything obeys me. At some time in eternity past, God said, you know, I would really like someone in my image that could love me. Now it gets interesting, because love, by definition, must be voluntary. So in this framework of everything he controls, he created something he does not control, your will. Now he could control it if he wanted to, but that would defeat the very reason he made us different than everything else. And he hides himself behind creation. Because if he ever revealed himself, he is so awesome, every molecule in your body would fall flat before him and worship him, and it would be an instinctive response. Like the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, I fell at his feet as dead. But he didn't want an instinctive response, he wanted a love response. So he hides himself behind creation. People say, well, if God's really real, why doesn't he show himself? If he showed himself... Yes, it would remove the doubt that he's real, but it would also remove your free will. Being in the presence 
of this being that creates the universe? So it's like a billionaire has a son who goes to college, flies in on his jet, drives up in his Lamborghini. He's got his Rolex watch, his fancy clothes. I mean, he's decked down. He's got his entourage following him around the campus. He's going to have every girl wanting to meet him. But if he lays all that aside and drives up in an old clunker, got holes in his jeans, the uppity girls are going to ignore him. But then he's going to find some girl that likes to study with him in the library and eat together in the cafeteria, and they get to become friends. And she takes heat from the clique for hanging around this nobody guy. But she believes in him. They fall in love. They get engaged. And then he says, I want to take you back to meet my dad. And they're like driving up to this castle mansion, and this girl's like, whoa, you didn't tell me about all this. He knows that she loves him for him, not because of all of his stuff. The creator of the universe humbled himself, right? Jesus, humbled as a man, born in a manger. Isaiah 53 says there was nothing in him that would make us want to desire him. He only wants those that love him for him. But he's a just God, and he cannot help it, which means he has to judge every sin. So he wants us to love him, but if we blow it in sin, he's going to have to judge us. So what does he do? He has a plan, and this is the plan of redemption. That the Father would send his son, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, to become the Lamb. So Abraham and Isaac are walking to the top of Mount Moriah, and Isaac says, Father, we have the wood for the sacrifice and we have the coals for the fire, but where, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says, Son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And it has a double meaning. I'm trusting God will have a ram up in a bush, but the other is God will provide himself as the sacrifice. And that's what happened. Jesus, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, became the Lamb and took the judgment for all of our sins. You know, I was reading the book of Revelation, still trying to figure it out, but one thing seems clear. It's God that's pouring out the, the judgment in the book of Revelation. Right. Right? The angel breaks the seal and throws the center, the lamb breaks the seal, and the angel throws the center down, lightning and thundering. And, uh, and why is that? Well, God's a just God, so he has to judge every sin he missed along the way. So you can't get 10,000 years into eternity and say, God, there was a sin back there and you never judged it. Uh, did you, were you giving consent to that sin? Is there a part of you that's unjust? Uh-uh, the angels cry out, Righteous and true are your judgments, O Lord, and the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. Nobody is ever going to question that God judges sin. But in that sense, Jesus had the book of Revelation judgment poured out on his head. He took the judgment for every sin that everybody would ever do upon himself on the cross. And I mentioned it in the first service, but... Uh, I have a degree in accounting, so I, I like things that balance. You take an eternal being, Jesus, who is innocent, suffering for a finite, limited period of time, is equal to all of us finite beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Let me say that again. An eternal being who's innocent, suffering for a finite period of time, is equal to all of us finite beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Right? An unlimited being suffering for a limited period of time is equal to all of us limited beings suffering for an unlimited period of time. Infinity times finite equals finite times infinity. Jesus, that's why he's sweating drops of blood. Because he sees that this wrath of God is going to come upon him. But out of love for the Father and out of love for you and me, he took the judgment for all of our sins. Why? So that we, as free will beings, could approach this perfect, universe-creating, all-powerful being and call him Father and be able to approach him without any consciousness of sin. That as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed you from your sin, he's thrown all your sins in the depths of the seas, blotted out every one of your transgressions, that you can approach this perfect, all-powerful God without any fear of it. You can run to him. You can embrace him. Because you're trusting in the Lamb that He provided. That's why we sing praise songs to Jesus. That's why Christianity is different from every other religion. Instead of us being good enough, as long as you think your relationship with God is based on you being good enough, you will always have this nagging thought in the back of your head, did I do enough? And your own conscience will tell you no. 
You did not do enough. You could never do enough to stand in the presence of this almighty, all-perfect God. But the moment you believe that Jesus paid for every one of your sins, every one, every one of them, all of them, yes, all of them, the moment you believe that, you're instantly in the presence of the Lord. You feel his love and his acceptance. And then you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And the Holy Spirit reaches out through you to the lost and dying world. So instead of you doing good works, hoping to earn brownie points with God, you're already accepted by God, and he's doing the good works through you, and his yoke is easy and his burden's light. It's like his magnetism overpowers you. You know, guys that work in workshops and you got a fat fingers and a little bitty screw and a little bitty spot and you just can't hold it. But if you take your screwdriver and you rub it on a magnet like a thousand times, your screwdriver gets magnetized. And you can put the little screw there and it stays on. You can stick it. When you rub up against the Lord, his magnetism, his Holy Spirit, and it's you. People are attracted to you, but not to you. They're attracted to the Holy Spirit in you. And they're drawn to Jesus and drawn to the Father. So today, let this be the day that you put all your trust in Jesus, that he is the lamb that this almighty creator God provided. And accept his love, trust in his sacrifice, so that you can approach God and know that your daddy loves you. He made you for this. He lo- you know, the more you love someone, the more you want that someone to love you back. God loves you infinitely. He has an infinite desire for you to love him back. But love He doesn't need your love, but he wants it. Parents and grandparents don't need the love of their kids and grandkids, but they want it. God doesn't need your love, but he wants it, and he created you for that purpose so that you could love him. And But as long as you feel like it's based on you being good enough, you're going to hesitate. But once he says, I have, remove that. It's paid for. You're free to love him and for him to love you. And I'll turn it back over to Pastor. before we are dismissed <clears throat> there's nothing more important than when you hear the gospel and you understand that Jesus loves you if you've never made that decision clear if you don't know for sure if you died right now that you'd go to heaven this is the time that the spirit of god is saying to you will you take that step and so god gave you a free will you can say yes or you can say no so if you said no Up to this point, today's the day to say yes. So with our heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today and you've never made that clear, and you're uncertain if you died right now where you would spend eternity, do it right now, would you just invite Christ into your life? And here's how you can do that. I'm just going to share a simple prayer of salvation with you. And if you'll pray this prayer, mean it with all of your heart, Jesus Christ will come into your life. Here's the prayer. You say it, mean it with all of your heart. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, and I know I cannot save myself. I ask Jesus Christ to come into my heart and save me and forgive me of my sins. I give you my life and my will. In Jesus' name, with our heads bowed, eyes closed. If you prayed that prayer and asked Jesus to come into your life, would you raise your hand right now and say, I did. Amen, amen, amen. That's wonderful, great. God bless you. God wants us to live for him, not just on Sunday morning. That's a great time to come together. But he wants us to leave here and bring our friends So I want to encourage you, set plans aside for tonight and tomorrow night and go get some of your friends and bring them back. Dr. Bill always closes the service with a clear presentation of the gospel. So I hope that you will be led uh, to participate and, uh, and take advantage of this tremendous teaching. Lord, we love you. 
we thank you for forgiving us of all our wicked sins. We pray that you would forgive the sins of this nation, especially the sin of killing innocent babies. And God, I pray you'd have mercy and that you would bring us godly leaders. May it start with our school boards and our city officials and lead all the way to the White House. And so, Lord, I pray you would raise up men and women of God that will stand for you in a loving way. So bless our church, our time together, and we ask that you would help us to come back again tonight and tomorrow night. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, before we- Hello, I'm Pastor Bruce Spear from Cross Point Church. I want to thank you for tuning in and watching one of our messages. We do hope that the teaching of the Word of God will impact your life and cause you to want to walk closer to the Lord Jesus. I hope that you will also consider supporting the Cross Point ministry so that we can do more for the cause of Christ. If you have questions about your spiritual walk, especially about how to invite Jesus into your life, I hope that you'll call us. God bless you. And again, thanks for watching.